Hi, everybody. Russ Barkley here. And uh, oh, by the way, this is our dog. Uh, this is Ali, but his nickname is Moose, which is a name that I prefer. Sometimes he would call him Mini Moose or Little Moose. Say hi, Moose. There he is. So he is a Catan. So we're going to get Moose down here. There we go. And today I want to talk to you about uh, very briefly ADHD as motivation deficit disorder. Uh, what do I mean by that? One of my subscribers wrote and said, would you please put together a very brief presentation that I can show to others, particularly my partner, uh, that explains why my motivation to get things done is so low sometimes and why I have difficulty with self-motivation. So I, uh, I put together this little slideshow. It's actually based on some of the other videos that are on this channel, but they're much longer. And the subscriber felt that people were not going to, that, that she couldn't use it to explain to her uh, friends, family, and partner uh, what her motivational problems were. So let me explain to you very briefly why ADHD could be considered to be motivation deficit disorder. So let me bring up my slideshow here because it has animation uh, and it helps to turn it on. So uh, how does ADHD, first of all, fit into the idea of ADHD as EFDD and executive function disorder? My other long lecture on that topic explains that, but essentially it looks like this. Uh, there is this general realm of self-regulation and it requires the basic executive functions of the human brain, particularly the prefrontal networks, uh, and these are called the executive networks uh, because they contribute to our ability to self-manage, to self-regulate, to see to our long-term welfare over time. So executive functioning is self-regulation, one domain, but we can break it, as I've said before, into two subdomains. One is inhibitory, which involves inhibiting more motor, verbal, cognitive, and emotional behavior. That last one is very important because it's not really in the DSM-5, uh, but I do have another presentation that I'll be posting on ADHD as uh, involving a problem with emotional self-regulation. The second domain is one that, for want of a better term, metacognition, uh, which simply refers to working memory, both nonverbal and verbal, as well as planning, problem solving, and other aspects of emotional self-regulation. Now, ADHD fits into this because the two symptom dimensions of ADHD are basically just subsets of these larger problems with executive functioning. The hyperactive impulsive symptoms obviously fit into the inhibitory component of executive functioning. And the inattention of ADHD really isn't inattention. It's a much broader problem with working memory, planning, problem solving, and emotional self-regulation, and to some extent, inhibition, because distractibility is related to inhibition. You must be able to resist responding to goal-irrelevant events. We also know that medications work by improving those two domains of executive functioning. Now, in my earlier presentation, I talked about the fact that as children develop, what is controlling their behavior changes dramatically. So that when they're younger, say age three, external events are much more likely to be regulating the, their behavior. But as we move into our 20s and 30s, mental representations about ourselves, time, the future, goals, plans, those mental representations, often held in working memory, start to guide behavior toward our goals. So we go from an external source of control to an internal mental source of what is guiding or controlling our behavior. This allows a second shift. We start to go from the need for others to manage us as we are when we're three, four, and five. But as we mature over the next 30 years, we come to self-management. And that is because we have these private mental representations that we're using to guide us so that I don't need my mother to wake me up in the morning, right? I can set an alarm clock. I can remind myself to do that as well. And that way of organizing my mental and my physical surroundings helps me to get up. So 
uh, we go from others to self-control. But most importantly with regard to this motivation deficit disorder is this third change in what is controlling us. We go from a sense of just the temporal now. Two and three-year-olds live in the moment. They don't think about yesterday. They don't think about tomorrow. They live here now. But as we grow up, a window on time opens. We begin to look further and further ahead from minutes to hours to days to weeks to months. And we begin to anticipate that future. So there's a window on time. And as events come into that window, we begin to activate to them. This is our intentional behavior, our goal-directed behavior. So there's this aspect of time that's very important here. And then finally, with that expanding window on time, we shift from preferring immediate consequences, things that are stimulating, rewarding, exciting now, to working for things in the future that are larger, more rewarding, and more likely to contribute to our long-term welfare. And that is what we mean by delayed gratification. We turn away from the seductions of the moment and we go for the bigger consequences down the road, later in time. And we work toward those goals with lots of different subroutines of behavior. But in general, what we're talking about is a shift from immediate to delayed gratification. Okay, so how can we use this to explain these motivational problems that ADHD produces? Well, first of all, understand that ADHD results in about a 30% or more delay in the transition across these four dimensions of behavioral control, uh, and specifically the ones that deal with the window on time and with immediate versus delayed gratification. So people with ADHD their behavior is being more governed by what is on the left side of this diagram, whereas other people of the same chronological age are being governed more by what is on the right side of the diagram. Now let's take a look at this temporal dimension. <clears throat> uh, in my other presentation on executive functioning, we talk about uh, the typical person. Here's what looks like Matt Damon. I'm not sure who it is, but uh, a typical person, as they develop, they go from anticipating the future just a few moments ahead to and when they enter school, anticipating the future a few hours ahead, maybe 8 to 12 by the time they're in third, fourth, or fifth grade. Don't worry about the age. It's the concept here. With advancing age, a window on time is opening, and we're looking and anticipating further ahead. By the time we're teenagers, we're looking out a couple of days. By the time we're entering college, we're looking out a couple of weeks. And by the time we get to our 30s, we're looking out about two to three months. So that's kind of the typical individual's development of this window on time, this anticipating future events. People with ADHD, as I've said earlier, have a very distorted sense of time. Most importantly, they are not governed by time the way others are. And so when we look at them and their development, they're not following the typical course up here. Their course of developing a window on time is much more truncated. So that, as you can see here, as they get into elementary school, they're not looking ahead 8 to 12 hours. They're barely looking ahead one. As they get into adolescence, they're not looking ahead a few days, maybe at most a half a day. And as they get into young adulthood, they're not looking two to three weeks out, but maybe a few days ahead. And then finally, as they get into adulthood, they're not looking anywhere near out as far as other adults two to three months out. So we can summarize ADHD as truncating this window on time. And so what happens then is that because we only activate to events that come into our window, that cross our time horizon, people with ADHD aren't going to activate to the future. They're not going to activate to goals, plans, and other things that require sustained effort over time because those things may not be important to them. They may not be entering their window on time as early as it does to other people. So they don't activate to them. They don't, uh, they're not motivated by them. They're not valuing them. And so what does that mean? It means that people with ADHD have an incredibly high time preference to use a term in behavioral economics. They prefer the now over the later much more than other people of their age do. Uh, in behavioral psychology, we call this temporal 
or reward discounting. The further ahead in time an event is, the less it's valued. And while we all do that, people with ADHD have a much steeper devaluation gradient or curve. So that the further out things are for them, the less they value, the less they work for it, the less motivating it is to them. And that discounting, that time preference is very different for them than it is for other people. So very important to understand that part of the motivational problem that ADHD gives rise to is due to this high time preference, this very truncated and narrow window on time and the future. Now, <clears throat> that's going to lead to a lot of problems because they're going to be throughout their day, hundreds of times a day, making decisions that require now versus later. Do I do this? Do I do that? Do I look out for myself now? Do I look out for myself later? Do I eat this donut now or do I put it aside in order to maintain my weight or lose weight? Uh, there are all kinds of decisions from health, wellness, eating, exercise, plus our goals, our education, uh, and managing uh, our children and dealing with other people that involve this conflict of now versus later. And the person with ADHD tends to opt for the now, the smaller reward now that's more stimulating, more exciting than the more boring task that they have to get done later. And that's going to create a tremendous motivation deficit disorder. Now, so I've taken you off the hook. That's a biologically based neuropsychological problem with the brain's executive network and particularly the network for self-motivation for working toward those longer term goals. People with ADHD therefore have a lot of trouble with self-motivation. When you put them in situations that involve work over time where there is no external consequence or reward right now for getting that done, they're probably not gonna finish it and instead opt to go off task to something that's much more interesting or valuable to them right now, much more exciting. So we get that motivational problem then with ADHD. So you're off the hook because that's neurobiological. But I'm going to put you back on the hook because you got to do something about that. You can't just write that off, excuse me, and say, you know, hey, you, you have to excuse my behavior because I have ADHD. ADHD is not an excuse for anything. It's an explanation. But it's not an excuse because you still need to do something about these difficulties. If you're a self-respecting individual with any degree of integrity, you need to find ways to compensate for those problems. So we've learned that the executive function network, uh, what we call self-regulation or SR here, is kind of a limited resource pool. It, it's like a fuel tank on my car. Uh, and uh, with people with ADHD, that fuel tank uh, is either empty or is emptied very quickly as a result of the work that they have to do. It takes them seven times more effort to motivate themselves to do what other people do, as some patients have told us. So, uh, But the important point here is that their fuel tank is more limited, their fuel tank is less full of fuel, uh, and is emptied very quickly. Um, so, all right, that's a neurobiological problem with the executive self-motivation system. On the other hand, there are things that you could be doing to compensate for that. And there's a variety of things that we have learned over time that help everyone restore uh, their resource pool. That is to increase their motivation to get things done. Uh, from things such as including more frequent rewards uh, and more positive emotions that you try to engender in yourself about getting this done. So sprinkle rewards throughout the task if you can uh, and break it into smaller pieces and you should find that that helps to motivate you to get that done by breaking projects down into small pieces and by arranging little rewards along the way, that can help us with self-motivation. Statements of self-efficacy, the locker room pep talk, I can do this, I know I can do this. Self-encouragement can also help. Verbal self-speech involving self-encouragement. Taking more frequent breaks from these very stressful and strenuous uh, activities that we're doing by strenuous, I mean demanding of our self-regulation. So work for 10 or 15 minutes, 
take a five to 10 minute break. Work, break, work, break. And by interspersing frequent breaks with the work, we allow that fuel tank to restore itself and we are less likely to deplete it. In addition to that, by just taking little relaxation breaks, just three minutes off, calm down, pant blow, and then use your meditation and your mindfulness-based practices to anchor yourself, come into the moment, spend a few minutes there, okay, back to work. That also helps to restore the fuel tank. So mindfulness-based practices might be useful things to use throughout the day when we are having motivational problems. In addition, visualizing the goal, talking about the goal, visualizing and talking about the rewards we're going to earn by accomplishing that goal have also been found to help typical and ADHD individuals as well. Now, in addition to that, recent research shows that routine physical exercise done frequently can help us with expanding our fuel tank and restoring our fuel tank. So whether it's going for a run, whether it's organized sports, whether it's martial arts, whether it's simply going out of your office or college and walking up and down the stairs, increasing our physical movement does seem to help restore this executive pool and allow us then to come back into a task and accomplish that task more likely than we would be otherwise to do. Lastly, though it's not on this slide, making ourselves accountable to others for the goals that we set for ourselves. And doing that several times across a day can indeed motivate us. There's nothing like making ourselves accountable to others to socially motivate people because now we've got skin in the game. We risk our respect, our reputation with other people if we don't do the things that we promised them we were going to do. So several times a day, you can talk to somebody, meet with somebody, hire an ADHD coach if you want to, to help make you accountable for the things that you said you were going to do during that morning or that afternoon and so on. There are many other things that you can be doing. You can take a look at my books uh, as well as my videos here on other things that adults with ADHD can do as well as children with ADHD. Uh, but all of this is simply to give you a brief explanation of why ADHD is motivation deficit disorder, but also why people with ADHD therefore need to take steps to reorganize, reorganize their environment in order to cope with and compensate for this inherent biologically based motivational difficulty. So I hope that helps you understand these motivational problems and I hope it gives you a short video that you can use with others to help them understand why you have these difficulties with motivation. Enjoy.